I'm going to read from the Bible, from Paul's first letter to Timothy, and chapter 1. If you've got your Bible with you, perhaps it would be a good idea to pull that out and maybe keep it open at this chapter for a little while. I think the words may be on the screen as well, yep. But if you've got a Bible, it's helpful to look at parts of the passage as I'm speaking this morning. So, Paul's first letter to Timothy, it's a little bit towards the end of the New Testament, Chapter 1, I'm going to read from verse 12 to 17. Here's the Apostle Paul writing. He says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory for ever and ever. Amen. So we're we're thinking about Christmas again this morning, and it's a real privilege, I must say, to speak so close to Christmas. I love speaking at Christmas time about the Lord, about the Lord Jesus, and it's a privilege to be asked to speak this morning on this 22nd of December. Um, Christmas, we're remembering the coming of Jesus, the coming of Jesus first as an infant, as uh, Phil said earlier. And it's there in in this verse uh, 15 of the reading I just read. Uh, Paul is writing about Christ Jesus coming into the world. Um, Christmas, the word, of course, is Christ Mass. It means the remembrance of Christ, the celebration of Christ. It's a celebration of Christ's coming. Christmas is this great miracle that we celebrate as Christians. Uh, The rather complicated word we sometimes use, the incarnation. It means that Jesus became a man, as again has already been said, quoting from John's Gospel, um, that the word became flesh. Um, I'll just read those um, verses from John's Gospel in chapter 1 briefly. They'll be very familiar for many of us, but in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And then a little bit later down, in again, the first chapter of John's Gospel, John writes, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus did not begin... When he was born as a baby, Jesus, the Son of God, existed from eternity. He's the Son of God, but we also call him God the Son. But he became flesh. He was incarnated, we say. He he became like us. I was speaking a month or so ago elsewhere and talking about what height was Jesus? Was he five foot six? Was he five foot nine? I just think thinking in those terms reminds us that he was our size. Ten fingers, ten toes, flesh. God took on flesh. We celebrate this amazing miracle, this wonder at Christmas, that God came into our world. I don't know about you, I find it extremely sad though that this message of remembering Christ is so often obscured by the focus upon the celebration itself and often upon us. What presents we're going to get, what you've asked for on your Christmas list, what your opinions about Christmas are, what your likes 
and dislikes about Christmas are. And maybe there's a whole commercial world out there that panders to what you prefer. It seems to me, particularly this year, I'm, I'm working for the Royal Mail at the moment, so I'm seeing an awful lot of Christmas cards and, in fact, sorting some of them. I was really pleased to hear, I was talking with Mark Story just as I came in, and Mark knows I've been working for the Royal Mail for the last month or so, and he said that he's noticed a marked improvement of the Royal Mail <laughs> and that his Christmas cards seem to have been coming a bit more regularly and a bit more promptly. And, well, I think that's really good, don't you? Yeah. I don't think I can claim all the credit for that, but maybe one or two, you know. But it seems to me that the more people have forgotten about the real meaning of Christmas, the more people are wanting to add baubles, to add decorations. The decorations only seem to be becoming more elaborate, don't they? The lights that you can buy in all of the shops, the sophisticated uh, displays, and yet sadly, people are getting further and further away from the real meaning of Christmas that we're talking about this morning. Too often it seems Christmas is simply seen as a commercial opportunity by the society around us, um, or as a feel-good time to watch a feel-good movie to try to make us feel good about ourselves, our families, our situations rather than focusing upon Jesus and upon what God did. For Christmas, most certainly, was an act of God. Christ came into the world, the Bible tells us here. And elsewhere in John's writings, the Apostle John, John speaks about God giving his Son, an act of God. God gave his Son, or God sent his Son into the world. But we, we need to ask again, I think, why did Jesus come? Why did God send his Son? Was it simply to show himself? Was it simply to bring about this great miracle of God becoming in the flesh, joining us, five foot nine, six foot maybe? But again, this same verse in this ancient writing, um, Paul's epistle to Timothy, it tells us why Jesus came. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. To save sinners. How much have you heard that in the shops as you've been out buying your lights? How much have you heard that on the radio? How much have you heard it on the BBC? Or the ITV or whatever it is these days? Channel 4. Christ Jesus came into the world that we should be able to celebrate Christmas? The winter months with lights and things? No. He came into the world to save sinners. It makes me think particularly that Christmas is actually about the dirty business of man's sins and man's sinfulness. You know, we like to sanitize these celebrations. We like to sanitize Christmas, and Christmas, as I've been saying, is often packaged for us. You can get a Christmas package of decorations. You can get Christmas packages of presents. Interestingly, this year, um, a few days ago, um, Anna was sent a package, a John Lewis, a small box. And we don't know who it's from. We literally don't. There's no greetings card in it. It says, to Mrs. Anna Nouch. And she had presumed it was from certain people, some relatives, and was on the phone to them the other day, and it turns out it wasn't from them. And we have no idea. If it's one of you, very kind people in the congregation this morning, let me give you our thanks. We really appreciate it. If it's not you, well, maybe you might want to claim it was you after all. I don't know. We still give you our thanks. You can buy packaged presents, packaged Christmas. But here's Paul the Apostle talking about Christmas, that is the coming of Jesus into the world, as being about the messy business of saving messy people, sinners. In other words, Christmas is about drug addicts. Christmas is about drunkards. Christmas is about liars and cheats. Anybody ever been a liar in this congregation this morning? Anybody still a liar here this morning? Christmas is about you, dear friend. 
Paul says as much in this very letter, just before the verses we read in verses 8 to 9, he was talking about the purpose of God's law and what it was about. He says, the law is not for those who believe, for the righteous, those who have been made righteous in Christ, but the law is there for lawbreakers and rebels. And he gives a rather big list of sinners and sinful behavior, the ungodly, the unholy, the irreligious for those who kill their fathers and mothers. In other words, Christmas is about dirty business for dirty people. For murderers, for adulterers, for perverts. And the words used in the original language there are extremely graphic. They cover every sort of human sin and sexual perversion. And Paul is saying, this is what Christmas is about. It was about God sending his son into the world to deal with the messy business of our sin, the dirty business of our sin. It wasn't just so that the church could have another celebration to add to its annual calendar. It was to clear up the dirty business of men and women's lives. Um, thinking about this, I was, uh, I was thinking we might even think of renaming Christmas. How about that? The government seems to be happy to rename everything else and other people. We could call it Christmas, not Christmas. You've heard, many of you, of Messy Church. I used to be at another church, and it seemed to me that we had Messy Church every week. Our church was always messy. But um, why not call Christmas, Christmas, in a sense? As, it, as it, we understand it, maybe afresh, as God seeking to deal with the mess of our lives. We could think of it as God getting messy, seeking to save fallen mankind. That fallen mankind might know forgiveness and reconciliation. I, I think it's right to say this about sin just further, that in many ways sin is the elephant in the room of modern society. You know what this phrase, the elephant in the room, means? It means something that everybody knows about but nobody talks about. Something that everybody knows about but nobody talks about. And when did you last hear the word sin, I wonder, in public discourse or on the media? It's become a forgotten word. Sadly, it's even become a forgotten word in some of our churches. Sin is no longer acknowledged, no longer named, and yet it's more and more present. Sin has been rejected as a concept. After all, since Freud, surely we're all just liberated now. We've been liberated from our repressions. We don't sin anymore. We simply act who we are. Or is it that we're now victims, all of us? None of us are sinners. The, the world around us tells us we're only victims now. Victims of society. Victims of somebody who's done wrong to us. Victims just awaiting our compensation. I wonder if, how you feel about that for your life. In the news this last week, there was an interesting article about the Netherlands, about Holland. Many of you will know that Holland has had a very liberal view towards sexuality, and particularly towards drug use for a good number of years. Um, open drug use has been legalized for a long time in the Netherlands. And many of you will know that this is something that's been talked about by various groups in our own country. But there was a murder recently in the Netherlands um, of a prominent lawyer, and it seems that this man had been shot in front of his family, in front of his wife, by organized crime. And the article was headed, Has the Netherlands become a narco state? Has the Netherlands become a narco state? In other words, it was comparing the Netherlands to countries like Colombia, where the drug lords ruled. And the question was being asked whether this highly civilized, highly intellectual, country at the center of Europe that had gone down this path of being very liberal, sexuality, drug taking, had actually put itself ultimately into the hands of organized crime such that they, people could start to think that it was a narco state. It was a state that was being run by the drug barons. And here were the drug lords saying to ordinary society, you don't arrest us. You don't go after us, these sort of lawyers. Otherwise, we'll do this to you. That's, I'm just simply 
repeating what was being done there. In other words, I'm saying God is not mocked. We can't simply accept sin and sinful behavior into society and not call it sin and treat it as normality and have no consequences. Sin is the desperate reality of the human condition. And sin, more than anything else, shows us the total weakness of man and woman. We are unable to save ourselves. And that's one of the deepest messages of the Bible, that mankind is unable to save itself. We're incredibly clever as a race, aren't we? Incredibly clever. And, you know, there's a scripture that's very dear to my heart in the Old Testament, right near the beginning of the Bible in Genesis, where God himself says that if mankind can get it together, speaking one language, they'll be able to do anything. Nothing will be impossible for them. And yet it seems that no invention that mankind has made, no act of cleverness yet, can save us from our own sinful nature and condition. And whatever mankind does, think of the television when that was invented, all the possibilities that came, and yet how corrupted that's become. Think of the internet. And I, I wonder what, what percentage of the internet, sometimes what people call the dark internet, is simply taken up with pornography, with abuse. It's a huge proportion. In other words, everything that man does is tainted, corrupted by sin. So much so that the same Apostle Paul that wrote this letter to us, that talks about Jesus coming into the world, talks about that same world groaning and longing to be cleansed, longing to be healed, longing to be set free from this bondage to corruption that the sin of mankind has brought it into. Christmas, then, is about God doing what mankind could never do, sending his son, Jesus, into the world to be the savior of sinners, to save sinners. That's what the Bible is telling us here this morning. To enable sinful men and women to be forgiven and saved, and ultimately, to inherit eternal life. That's what Paul says there in verse 16. Um, Paul talks about himself as the worst of sinners, so that Christ might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and those who would receive eternal life. That's us, dear folks. Paul's speaking about himself as being an example for those who would later come to believe in Jesus and receive eternal life. He's talking about us, though. So we, too, are in this passage this morning if we believe in Jesus. As Phil mentioned this morning, Christmas is not the whole story. Christmas is not the whole story because the coming of Jesus at Christmas time as a child, as an infant, it leads through the Gospels to the preaching of the Gospel, the preaching by John the Baptist, the preaching by Jesus himself, a preaching of a message of repentance and faith in Christ. It leads to the revelation of Jesus as a man, a man teaching people what it was to know God and what God's ways were, a, a, a man who showed God's power through his miracles, his healing, his casting out of demons, and yet a man ultimately who was rejected by those around him. The message of Christmas leads to the suffering of Christ. It leads to Jesus' death upon the cross, Again, as Phil mentioned already. But happily, it also leads to Jesus' burial and resurrection from the dead, the things we celebrate at Easter, and to Jesus' ascension into heaven to sit at God's right hand. Christmas includes all of these things for us this morning. Christmas leads to all of these things. It's not Christmas itself, it's not the coming of a baby into the world itself that brings peace with God. It's all that that baby child grew up to be and do for us and for our sakes. I love the creed, you know, the, the famous Nicene Creed that says, he came, he suffered for our sakes. It was for our sakes, dear friends, for your sakes, for mine. Unworthy, 
rebels, sinners, that Jesus came. Theologians call all of this, all that Jesus was and is and did, the work of Christ. And sometimes as Christians, we will talk about the finished work of Christ. It's Christmas all the way to his ascension, and indeed his coming again. This is God's way to save sinners. This is God's provision for people to experience this forgiveness of sins and reconciliation to God. It began in this world at Christmas, but it led to the cross and to the resurrection. Well, I'm basically telling you the good news this morning, that Christ came into the world to save sinners, and that this is God's way of saving sinners. But it also causes to say, what is our necessary response? How should we respond to this message, this message of Christmas this morning? Do we simply go out to the shops and buy some more presents? A response to this message is necessary. Salvation is not automatic. Some people may think that because Jesus came into the world, salvation is automatic for everybody. Um, I'm working nights at the moment at the Royal Mail, and it's, ro it's, got, it's got a little bit stale because there's a medley on in the background in this huge warehouse sorting office building of Christmas songs. And some of them are wonderful, and some of them are absolutely awful. Especially when you've heard them for about five or six times in the same night. And you think, oh no, is that Boney M again? And I'm not quite sure how much I can listen to Noddy Holder again, you know. But uh, one of the songs, I think it was Boney M, wasn't it? Oh, Little Town of Bethlehem, speaks about because he was born, he brought um, eternal life. Men will live forever, as though it was automatic. As though because Jesus came, as though because we have this message of the coming of God in his Son, that everybody will automatically be saved. But that's not what the Bible teaches. It teaches that we need to make a response, an individual response even. How do we receive this salvation that Paul is talking about here, that Jesus came to bring? How do we receive this forgiveness that is part of this salvation? Well, fortunately, in this very passage, Paul sets himself out, as I've already briefly mentioned, as an example for us to think about. Let me read verse um, 15 again. Um, here is a trustworthy saying that demands full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, but he doesn't even just stop there. He says, of whom I am the worst, or literally, of whom I am the first. The first, the authorised version, the King James Bible translates it as, as the chief. Some of you will know that famous book by John Bunyan, Abounding Grace to the Chief of Sinners. It's taken from this very passage. He talks about the abounding grace a little bit in, in verse 14. But he says, I myself am an example of what the grace of God looks like. He says, I was the chief of sinners. Look at some of the things he says about himself there. Verse 13. Even though I was once a blasphemer. I wonder if anybody here has been a blasphemer. I wonder if anybody here is still a blasphemer. I was a persecutor. I was a violent man. Paul beat people, he's saying. You can read elsewhere in the New Testament. Paul was a horrible person. He tortured Christians. He tried to get people to blaspheme Christ. He imprisoned men and women. He was somebody that we might think of as coming from Soviet Russia in olden times, or somebody that we might read about in China at the present, a torturer of Christians, seeking to force people to turn from Christ. And what Paul is saying in this passage is, Christ saved me by his grace. And he says, he set me up like a display. He put me on display as the first trophy, if you like, so that people coming after could say, if he saved Paul, he can save anybody. 
If he saved a man like that, such a dirty sinner, such a disgusting man, he can save anybody. And I don't know if there's anybody here this morning that feels sometimes disgusting. Maybe you're not a Christian yet. Maybe you've made steps towards faith and maybe you still feel unclean, that you're not worthy. Let me tell you, you're not as bad as the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul said, I was the worst of sinners. He's not saying he's continuing in those sins. He says, I was a sinner like this. And the response that he's talking about here first is a response of repentance. He confesses his own sins. He confesses his own sins. I was a violent man, a blasphemer, a persecutor. And he can do that openly because he knows he's been forgiven. You know, one of the wonderful things about forgiveness is if you know that God has truly forgiven you, you don't mind what anybody knows about you. You have a complete freedom, a tremendous personal liberty. If the king of the universe has accepted you, has forgiven you, who cares what anybody else thinks? And so the response that Paul is modeling here for is the first part of it is repentance. That is the acknowledgement of our sins and of our sinfulness. And let me just say, there can be no forgiveness without confession and repentance. Forgiveness is not a reality unless we realize we have that which we need to be forgiven from. Unless we accept God's verdict upon us and upon our behavior that we've been sinful and that we are sinful of ourselves. Only then can we start to put ourselves in a position or be brought into that position whereby we can receive forgiveness, realizing truly who we are, realizing and accepting God's verdict, not what we like to think about ourselves. It sounds like I'm always listening to the BBC or looking at the BBC news, but again, there was a little survey on the internet there a few weeks ago. And one of the questions, it was all about morality, really. And one of the questions was, um, do you tend to think of people as basically good or basically bad? Do you tend to think of people as basically good or as basically bad? And how do you tend to think of yourself? I think it's true that most of us will probably observe that most people around us tend to think of themselves as pretty reasonable, as good people. You know, they'll say, well, I'm not an axe murderer, and I've visited my mum this week, or whatever else it is, and I've looked after the dog, oh, and fed the cat, and I bought the wife a little present for Christmas. We tend to build up our stock of sort of self-righteousness, don't we? And most people go around thinking they're pretty good reasonably. But the verdict of Scripture is that we're sinners, that we're not good at heart. In that survey, apparently, it turned out only 4% of people in the UK accept what the Bible says there. Only 4% of people. Now, I'm not quite sure what the current percentage of Christians in the, in the country is, whether it's 5%, 6%, 7%. But that probably means that even amongst some people who go to church and call themselves Christians, there's probably those who may not actually have a true view of what, share the view that God has of us, that we are fundamentally not right and we need to be put right with God. So repentance, confessing our sins, acknowledging both what we've done wrong and that there is that in us which is fundamentally wrong that we call sin. But then there's faith, of course. Faith. The righteousness of God comes through faith. Salvation comes through faith. The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, is the power of God for salvation to all them that believe. To all them that believe the message. To all them that receive the message of Jesus. And Paul speaks about that faith again at verse 16 that I already read. I'm the worst of sinners, he says, but for that very reason I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him. For those who would believe on him. The way of salvation is faith. The way of salvation is faith. Not in ourselves, though, dear friends. 
not faith in mankind. And again, it's tragic how many of those Christmas songs I've been hearing speak about some sort of vague faith in the goodness of mankind and the ability of mankind to do good. But as you listen to the news and as you look around you, shouldn't we be continually reminded again and again and continually aware that left to itself, mankind only does harm, even to one another? It's faith in Christ, faith in what God has done that leads to this salvation. And that it's a salvation that leads to eternal life. So our response needs to be those two things. Repentance, that includes acknowledgement of our sins, and faith, faith in Christ, faith in God, but as Jesus said, you believe in God, believe also in me. See how Jesus puts himself, and where Jesus puts himself in that statement in John's Gospel again. Right level with God the Father. You believe in God? See, it's not a vague belief in God that makes you a Christian. It's a belief in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and as the Saviour. Let me say that again. It's not a vague belief in God that makes you a Christian. It's a specific belief in Jesus Christ as the one who died for your sins on that cross that followed from Christmas, that followed from his coming as a baby. And Paul says, I'm the example. I'm the prototype. If he can save me, he can save anybody. So this scripture, this passage, and our message this morning is that Christmas is about the salvation of sinners. It's about the forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ. And the, 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 the message this morning, the title that was given for us was A Longing for Forgiveness. And as I've reflected upon that, I feel, though, that that longing is not fundamentally a human longing, if I may say. It's a longing of God himself. See, the longing for forgiveness, fundamentally, is the longing of God's heart for every one of us that we might know forgiveness. It's God who sent his Son into the world. It wasn't we who climbed up to where God is. It's God who gave his Son to be a sacrifice. It's God who desires not the death of a sinner, but that everybody should repent and know his forgiveness. It's God and the grace of God. that It's the work that God does. By his grace, we can come into that longing for forgiveness as we accept and believe what he's done. But it does seem to me that this longing for forgiveness is fundamentally a divine character first rather than a human characteristic. I think most men on the street, most women on the street, they don't go around thinking, I want to be forgiven. As I've already said, they don't even go around thinking they're sinners until they hear the message of the gospel. But I ask you this morning, what is your response to this message, this message of Christmas, this amazing time as we are remembering and celebrating the coming of Jesus, the coming of God himself into this dirty world. Does this message stir up in you a longing for salvation? Does it stir up in you a recognition that you're not yet saved, that you can't yet fully say Jesus is my Savior? Does it stir up for you a longing of forgiveness for sins? Can I say, if you're not yet a Christian this morning, you can make some of those first steps towards Jesus this Christmas by realizing that this is the true meaning of Christmas. Not the shopping, not the gifts, not the baubles on the tree, but Christmas is about God's plan to save sinners, people like you and me. Maybe you've been coming to church for some time. Maybe you've heard this message a number of times. Maybe you need to make an extra step of commitment this morning. Maybe you do believe to a certain degree, but you've not yet made a commitment to Jesus. I wonder if you're somebody who believes but has not been baptized yet. And you need to stand up and say, yes, I want to stand with Jesus. I want to express my faith publicly. Well, again, this Christmas perhaps is a time for you to respond in that way. 
and to say, I want to take coming to church, I want to take being a Christian seriously. I've been coming to church for a few weeks or for a few months or even for a few years. You know, it's possible to come to church but still not be a Christian. The Apostle Paul was devoutly religious before he became a Christian, but he was opposed to God. So I ask you this morning, how do you respond to Christmas this year? What is your response? You can know the forgiveness that God longs for you this year if you're ready to acknowledge your sins and to call out in faith to God in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm going to lead us in prayer and then we're going to sing our closing song. But I'd ask you just come before the Lord as we pray and quiet your heart for a moment. I'm not ask, going to ask anybody to do anything, but let's just pray together before the God who sent his son at Christmas. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do praise you again for the message of Christmas. Lord, that it is about the dirty business of our sins. And it's about your great hope, your great longing to save men and women, Lord. We thank you that Jesus is the good shepherd who comes looking for his sheep. And Lord Jesus, we call upon you this morning, and Holy Spirit, I call upon you that you would make this message real this morning to every person here today, that we will know afresh the true meaning of Christmas, the true joy that you sent your Son into the world to save sinners. And Lord, if there are those here this morning who do not truly know you, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will make it clear that you will reveal yourself and reveal the Lord Jesus Christ to their minds and hearts and spirits and that you'll make yourself known, Lord. And, oh, Lord, for those of us who are on the edge, perhaps, those of us who have been standing around, looking in, and wondering whether it's really for us being a Christian, whether it's really right for us to stand up for Jesus, I pray, Lord, that you will give us courage, and that you'll give such people courage, Lord, to stand up for Jesus, to declare themselves as a Christian, and to live their lives for you. So, living God, we, we honor you this morning by declaring the message of your Son. And we thank you for your mercy and for your grace that you sent Jesus at Christmas. Amen.